Uh, this whole thing got started with the, the unified method when I, I was uh, reviewing a manuscript. I, I'd read about a little bit about the unified method before, at least the fall club, but well, there really wasn't much, wasn't much in there about it. And uh, so, but later on, I was reviewing a manuscript for uh, publication in the first uh, Mississippi River, Yangtze River uh, uh, symposium proceedings, and, and I, one of the, the authors said, was happened to mention offhand that this unified method in these shallow water lakes was, you know, that was 85 percent or greater. Uh, if they didn't get 85 percent or, or greater of the target fish, they considered it a failure. And uh, so, uh, um, so I said, "Wow, okay, I want a piece of that action." And uh, well, kind of got together with Kevin, and Kevin got together with commercial fishermen, and um, and we went over there, and, and they were good enough. Uh, and Yushin Chin and the, and the IHB uh, guys, they were good enough to really help us out uh, and put us in contact with some of the groups that were actually doing this kind of stuff, got us together with them. Uh, we'll have, I think Kevin will talk a little bit more about that uh, during his talk. Uh, but uh, this is our, our first try, this is a, kind of an aftermath of the, the first try of doing this thing in, in, uh, in uh, Illinois, and, and the fish are all balled up there. Uh, there was a lot of fish during this process that were also removed with gill nets. They, in China, they do use gill nets, uh, but the, they try not to catch their fish in gill nets. They want to get them at the end, uh, preferably in a big trap net. Um, they uh, they use a, a thing they call a stone net at the end, but in, usually rather than sane. And the reason for that is partly because they want to get them all over a long period so they can keep taking them to the market and they don't want to get all their fish in one day like this and so uh, sometimes that's okay for us you know we pull this kind of thing net out and we don't have to be there for every day for two months pulling fish out i wonder if i can take this thing stay out of the way does that work okay good okay this is just some of the history of it uh, um, this is my wife was kind of was there during this particular trip to China, and so she was kind of a fly on the wall taking these pictures. And uh, but you can see that there's quite a lot of energy in this room, and it's kind of interesting that uh, only uh, there's like two people in this whole room that speak both languages, and that we really didn't need another person to, to get a bunch of fish in the room. It was very very fun. Uh, but uh, so in shallow, there's the shallow water unified method, then there's a the deep water method, and we were really more trained in the, in the shallow water method, right? And, and basically, the shallow water is a method is any place where you can put a, a net deep enough to go top to bottom. And the, the uh, unified method is any deeper than, than that. And Matt, uh, that is a deep water unified method, and, and Matt uh, has been doing some stuff with Dresden Island, in places where you can't set nets. It really kind of mimics that deep water method. We really haven't, I don't know a whole lot about that, uh, but it does seem to what Matt's doing, as far as I know, really mimics the, the uh, that deep water method in Dresden Island pool, where you're pushing the fish without any nets, really. Uh, but and this this uh, picture over here is a picture of uh, Creepcore Lake, and these are the approximate positions of nets that we laid in there driving these fish. But the concept is um, to uh, and the whole idea of the unified method is you fish body water as a unit. And you want to drive the fish slowly towards some central capture location. Uh, sometimes I think uh, in some of the unified methods you've been doing more recently, you're actually making a, a cell and then fishing that cell. Well, that sort of works too because you know uh, because what happens? The biggest problem with with the with the Asian carp fishery, and it's also what the reason this works is that these fish are unrooted. They don't have a, a, an area that they're stuck with. I just had a couple of fish in, in, uh, that we tagged in, in Hungary move 110 miles, 110 kilometers in the uh, first week after we tagged them, and it's kind of almost random in this movement, right? They're, they don't have a real defined home range, which makes them easy to drive. They don't, they, the slightest little disturbance, and they're out of there. So the, that's what kind of makes them hard for, to catch in a gill net, is because you start setting gill nets, and by the time you start running the boat motor anywhere near them, they're in another part of the lake or they're in another part of the river. And that's what makes them kind of hard to catch. Uh, with the 
Uh, you know, what some of these guys do, like Orion Briney, he runs a kilometer net yeah. at one time and basically loops up the whole school and then catches his fish. You know, he spots a school and goes and, and, um, and catches his fish by running a net around the whole school, by running a huge net. But this is another way to get to the same thing and you, and you really, you're going to impact the whole lake at one time. And you, when, you, when you go away, there's going to be a lot less carp. But you have to think about this as a as one big unit instead of just going out and trying to find the fish and put a net on. And the another thing that, that uh, is really nice about it is that this doing it this way, where you drive the fish slowly to a collection point, most of our native fish don't drive nearly as easily. So what that means is your your bycatch is really low. Because you know, as you drive these fish across the lake, they're gonna, you, they're not gonna want to leave that whole branch. And eventually, they're gonna hunker down and hide. And your catfish don't drive at all. You know, they just, we essentially don't catch catfish in this method at all. The, uh, um, you rarely catch, I mean, any substantial amount of, of, of scale fish other than buffalo. The buffalo do drive a little bit, so you're gonna catch the buffalo. Um, and and one that drives pretty well, at least it seems like to me, is the. Is the uh, your smaller drum, they seem to get pushed pretty easy. Uh, but most of our game fish don't drive that well. And when, and when we were doing this thing, you, you'll see that, and that uh, you know, we didn't catch any, we were pushing these fish with electric fishing and, and sound. And so we catch, we see a lot of natives that come out of the top, but in very few, if you're doing it right, you're not seeing, uh, you know, big headed sharks at all. And the grass carps, they don't drive as well as the big headed carps, and they'll hang up in the, the uh, in, you know, large wooded debris and that sort of thing. And, and so you'll catch some of those, but they do seem to drive fairly well. So, anyway, don't get too scared by looking at all these nets because what we found during this process is, you know, we have about two and a half miles of net, most of it that we borrowed from, uh, from Kevin at the use of the first thing. And we, and we drove these fish by you know putting these individual cells. There's actually some of these, there actually was another one there that we didn't get recorded, and there's another one. You know, you can see a few places where we got bigger holes. But we did this whole thing like pretty much like the way they they described it to us in China, which is you make a line across and make a comb, and then you drive the fish out of each one of these cells and then block them off one at a time. Now that just looks like a lot of net laying in it is. But what we found in the process of doing it is this, we did a whole lot more work than we really needed to do. You know, the, these fish, I think we could have, on the first day, driven these fish up to there because they were so easy to push using these sound techniques that we could have basically dropped that net across that in the middle of the lake, you know, and we would have had most of those fish on the other, on the, on the direction we were trying to push them. But, uh, so, you know, in, in China, they do this thing with over months or at least several weeks. And, and they, again, they don't really want to get all the fish in one day. They don't want to finish this up as rapidly as possible. What they want to do is have a steady supply of fish that they can provide to the market alive every, every day. So when we modify this thing, this is one of the key modifications. Is we, want to, we, we don't really care if we get all our fish in in one day as long as it doesn't totally over the the uh, whatever facility we we've got to put the fish in, right? The, um, but again, you just basically divide the lake into cells. Early on in this process, you can make these cells huge. They don't have to be like this. And, the, but, uh, um, and then, you know, they, and they, they would catch the fish in the trap net slowly over, over months. And, and they, to lay all these nets, the way they do it, you're gonna take a lot of people, many workers. If this is something that does require a lot of coordination, but uh, that is, uh, you know, when we start taking this to our systems here, we want to do some things a little bit differently. I'm going to show you these videos and, and uh, we'll... Uh, I might play it a couple of times so we can tell you what's going on. Uh, in, in this video right now, that photo over there, that boat right there is, is currently, I forget whether it's laying or retrieving another cell net. I think, yeah, this one is, uh, he's, they're picking up this, this, this uh, piece of that comb right now, so then they'll take it to another spot. We've got these two boats here, right? these are sound boats, and they actually start back here, and you know, and we're just driving over top of this, we can lift the motor, it's not hard at all to, 
it would just drive over top of these nets if you know what you're doing um, the, uh, without hurting the nets. So these, these two boats here are what we call sound boats uh, in this particular demonstration. And, the, and they, they've got the recorded sound on them and the fish respond to this very well. What we've, and they're, they're, they're responding to this clear out here. And as we're driving these fish, what we found is these cells could have been a lot bigger because by the time we get to, when we drive this cell, this cell's empty and then the next cell's empty too, too. So we don't really even need to do this. I mean, at this point in the game, because they're already we're, we're moving the fish totally out of this region of the of the uh, by using the sound and electric fishing technique together. Uh, these uh, this uh, this this boat there is uh, this is make sure you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, these two boats are electric fishers. No, this boat and, and that boat are electric fishers. And uh, the I, I don't even know what that guy's doing. But this is the e Blue. Uh, this is my large boat, and it's got uh, currently on there. That's got uh, uh, 3,000 uh, foot of net on that on that boat, and this is a pretty heavy one-inch mesh uh, block net that uh, that Kevin bought from uh, uh, from uh, at Miller Net. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, I think it's real high quality net that they put together. I mean, they're probably not the only producer, but just that is one producer that. Uh, that has produced a really good net for it. Uh, but, and you'll probably see it's not, it's not a picture of this boat here, but uh, um, I'm gonna, and so the, you see these two boats moving around. These two boats actually started out here, where it, and, and it's been driving this direction, and the fish are leaving out this big gap, you know. And so when, and when we get to the point, oh, there's a boat running around in here uh, that's got a side scan sonar on it too, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And so, the, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the uh, side can sonar boat as we're I'm driving one of these uh, sound boats, but there's a couple of people in the, in the side scan boat, and they're driving, driving around inside of this thing, making sure that we're not seeing any fish. And then when we, they don't see any fish, um, and, you know, I'll, I'll give the yell to the e blue, and he takes off and covers and cuts this thing over. I'm going to play this one more time so he can kind of get an idea. Okay, so you can see, you've got uh, three of those guys that are picking up net, they're just pulling it into the boat. You got these two sound boats and we're, and, and you know, a lot of the, what this moving around is, is just to keep from being blown again, up against because it's windy, keep from being blown up on, on the sides of this thing, you know, because uh, you have to keep moving around. In these tight corners like this, uh, we never had a collision or anything, but uh, what we found is we really didn't need these tight corners. We could have made these nets, these, these cells a lot bigger in this video when we were making this video. And I'm going to call it the next video in that series. So I'll give you the order for the e-balloon to take off. You see it dropping the left net out. And it'll run across here. The two sound boats are still in. Over here on the left is the side scan boat going in here to see where the fish are in this other one. Um, the e is about halfway across at this point. You've got the two sound boats are still in here and the electric fish boats are on the outside at this point in time. And so the boat will, you know, people will go over there and eventually will hook up to the other side. And you've got a cell that's clear. And they'll go over here and hook up to this buoy. You see a lot of people on board of this, on board that boat. Uh, the reason for all those people is because they've got 3,000 feet of net to pull here shortly, and that's heavy net. And so um, what we're doing now is we're getting, uh, Ron mentioned a net puller um, that, that his, uh, one of his commercial fishermen's getting, we're getting one of those on here. Uh, we'll probably put one on one of these other, uh, you know, 22 foot boats as well uh, for setting the smaller nets. And, uh, but that should really speed this up and make it a two person process instead of a six person process to pull 3,000 feet of net and speed it up so we can move along this process faster. That a net puller fix on that boat costs about ten thousand dollars. So it gives you an idea of what you're getting into and I really recommend that you probably go that route if you're gonna do this very much because it's gonna be a, a labor saving device. The uh, uh, and it, this isn't something that's you know we've we've invented it or anything like that. This is a standard operating thing that any lots of commercial fishermen use a lot all you know the Great Lakes use them in the 
in the uh, salt water a lot. I haven't seen them too much application in fresh water, but we're not inventing something. This is something that people uh, people use, and, and if you're going to be pulling 3,000 feet of net by hand, you're crazy. Let's let's go ahead and, and put do something that'll just pull that net in the boat for you, and you just have two people stack it so it goes out nice. Next time, the uh, so there's there's a. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to this method, and to use this uh, method in the United States, you know, it, it works really, really well in lakes. Uh, you got really, really uh, very little bycatch. We talked about that earlier. You really almost killed no game fish. I mean, really, we had if, when we pulled that net, we had two bass in that net, um, and a couple of crappies, and quite a few uh, fresh, small freshwater drums. And that, you know, that is the fish that you may impact your freshwater drum. Um, but uh, for the most part, you know, certainly in this thing, like 97.9% of the fish in here by biomass are, are, uh, were Asian carps, and the rest of it was, you know, was, was rough fish. So with the exception of a couple of bass, I think two crappies, um, but there was, it was almost nothing in there that, that was a game fish. Uh, and you can go into shallow lakes, and by, by shallow lakes, I include this one, you know, because you can run, for most of this lake, you can put, uh, you know, you can run this, the net deep enough to cover the top and bottom for most of, the, most of this lake. So you can do big chunks of this lake or the whole lake and using a unified method if you have big enough effort. It just would require a tremendous amount of, you know, that, this lake is enormous, it covers the whole you know, stay top to bottom, and but but you could conceivably do this. I mean, they would do this in China. They would run this lake in, in, as one unit, and you know they do it bigger lakes than this one uh, as one unit, and they catch they don't catch 85 percent of the lake you know, and, and other fish in a lake that big, but they do a pretty good job of knocking out a lot of the fish. Uh, again, the other thing about the same method that we're using, and also the the big uh, uh, crap net that does allow sorting the fish. If you're, if you're catching the fish in a gill net, you're going to have more. Uh, if, you're, if your gill net size is small enough to catch your target, you know, non-target fish, then you're going to have some bycatch mortality. But, uh, but if it's, uh, you know, you're keeping that gill net size up there, you're probably going to get around here. You're going to get only in patterns. But um, the, uh, but as you do get into these smaller gill nets, and the size of the fish gets smaller. You're going to start hitting more of your, your non-target species, and the gill nets are expensive, and they're hard to run, and time-consuming. So I don't like to use them. I like to try to not use them and just get them at the end. And this, in the pre-core effort that we did, we didn't use a single gill net. We never put one in the water. We brought them with us. We didn't use them. We didn't need them. So, but there are some hurdles. We're going to deploy this particular method in uh, in the the uh, and, and this particular lake was uh, some 300 acres, 320 acres, I believe, something like that. Uh, the, the uh, you know, you're going to have to think about the kind of habitat that you're going to do. It does take some planning because you want to go into a situation where you're going to, uh, you're, when you want to drive a, a, a lake like this, you want to say, okay, where are the problem spots? Get them first because when the fish get uh, uh, they get acclimated to this this thing, or they realize they're being pushed around a lot, they get jumpy and they're going to get hard to push out of those hard push holes. So think about where are the spots. How am I doing on time, by the way? Okay, I got to move along. Uh, but you're going to have to do your spots. Uh, Ten minutes towards what? The half hour? Or the, okay, yeah. I'm going to take a little more than that. Right. Easy. So that, that, that I can good. see. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, so all of these, oops, sorry. All of these things uh, are uh, problems that we see cropping up and trying to address these different things. And you have to, and planning is also really, really important. Again, you want to pick up those, those places that are hard to, to you've got, you got some large wooded debris, you've got a deep hole. Once you get these fish stirred up and you got it in a deep hole, they're, they're a lot harder to move. It's harder to move them uphill. So if you've got a deep hole, you, you've got to get them out of there you know, early on before they, 
think that they realize that there's something going on. Because once you get in a deep hole later, you're not going to move. Um, they, you know, there are places where you just can't really set up this kind of a shallow water thing, even if it's shallow, because you've got navigation, uh, you've got recreational fisheries, you're probably not going to want to do this right outside the marina in the middle of a busy season. You know, it's, it's just not feasible at, at, at some points in time. But I think most places, if you do this in January, uh, maybe you're not going to have nearly as much problem. And cold water is the best time to do it, because if you're blocking, using block nets, they don't jump when the fish, when the water's cold enough. I mean, you, they, you can make them jump, but if you get it down, you know, in the, the water temperature in the low 40s, they don't jump hardly at all. And so then you don't have to worry about the things that's going back over the nets into your cleared cells. Um, the, uh, I did mention that Matt O'Hare has been doing something like a deep water method. I was, it was let um, Kevin and Matt talk about that because I have not participated in that particular effort. Um, but again, you've got currents, you can't use these nets, they're going to clog up, they're going to fill up, they're going to be pushed over. you got any, any places, you know, a big lake big enough to get like long short current from the wind, you're probably going to get, and if there's any debris, and get caught those nets, you're going to rip them out. So you have to think about that and water deep enough that's really deep, you either have to get them out of that water first. You can't set your net through the middle of deep water because if there's a, any holes, they will find it once they can start to get a little bit stressed. Or early on, you don't have to worry as much about that sort of thing. But once they get a little bit stressed and think they're in trouble, you can't leave them any opening because as soon as you go home that night, they're going to find that and they're going to be on the wrong side of your net. And this is a big thing in, in China where they will push these fish for two months because they're doing it slow, they don't really care how long it takes them, they've got they, nobody to get out of the way of. But if they screw up during that process, the, you know, wind blows and all the fish end up on the wrong side of the nets behind them, you gotta start all over and that's a huge tra and travesty. And uh, so you, you have to think about not screwing up. You gotta plan and you gotta knock them up and you can't, can't leave any holes. Um, the, here in the, in the U.S., we, we got a long tradition of fishing but they don't think this way. They're independent operators. Most of these guys, you know, two guys in a boat, you know, um, maybe a, a commercial fishing operation. And two guys in a boat isn't going to pull one of these unified methods off. And so guys don't like to change the way they've done things since they're, you know, since the, uh, you know, the great grandpa was doing it. But I think if you show them the money, they have, you know, that they'll like, adapt into the uh, ways of doing things. The, uh, I think that this, you know, Illinois and Kentucky are, you know, have been contracting with commercial fishers for a long time now, and I think that's probably will help if we, if we try to institute this type of thing that, you know, because they're getting used to doing the things the way they have to do it to work with the states. So, um, and, and, and it's be up to, up to the managers whether you, you want to take, if you want to use it, Unified method. It's going to be up to the managers whether you want to say, okay, let somebody do it. You, you know, here's your, here's your restrictions, and you put, you know, some fishery company in, in, in front of it. Or if you want to say, okay, uh, we're going to control this really tightly. We're going to be in charge of this commercial fisherman. You're going to do that, and the, you know, you're going to do that. Or if you don't even run it with commercial fishermen at all, but uh, you know, you're going to want to run this with people who know how to use boats and don't run over nets because it's another thing. You can't just put a bunch of uh, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into this thing with a bunch of private individuals that think they know what they're doing, but they're going to get out there and run over your expensive nets, and, and, uh, and that would be a bad thing. So, the, uh, and we really do need to work on this, this particular aspect. This is a problem. We, we, know, we would like to be able to catch a lot more fish and trap nets rather than the same, uh, like they do in China. But it's maybe not as important for us as it is for them. Uh, right, and, our success to date in getting these fish and trap nets has been limited. We're not catching the numbers of fish that we'd like to catch, and we're still working on how to make that better. Um, the logistics of doing this thing and the economics of it, you know, are different. You have to think about it a different way. It requires different equipment. It's capital equipment that is reusable. You don't have to buy it every year. You don't run through it like you do gill net, you know, because you know gill net you commit it to a certain extent, but you're going to have to replace that thing. If you're fishing it heavily, you're going to go through at least every year. You're going to you're going to tear up a net enough that you want to replace it. These things are nets that you want to uh, keep around for the long term. You know, 
a decade or more uh, before you replace them. And you're going to want to, if you do hurt them, you're going to want to fix them. Um, you, we have to think about the way to get rid of large volumes of fish over a short period of time. And when you've got you know, a quarter million pounds of fish on the, on the bank in, in you know, a day and a half, as we had at, at Creveport, that is a lot of fish. And so, the, you know, it was, you know, I, I think that was a surprise to some of our collaborators. How would we possibly deal with this? And, you know, this huge number of fish, and it had happened to be that it came up on a Saturday, and when the, the, uh, they were hauling the fish to the dump, and there was no place. We had like four of these giant dumpsters at the time lined up to take fish, but that wasn't even close to, to taking a quarter million pounds of fish. So, with 240,000 pounds of fish is what we ended up getting the fish for. But trying to do things that are labor saving, like, oops, like, you know, like this, uh, uh, like this thing here, this grayler, you know, that really helps. Rather than going in and pulling out one fish at a time, you can put grayers on boats, or you know, rather than using one of the big long arm cranes like we did there. But trying to figure out ways to do stuff that's less, uh, um, less labor intensive, because the way they do it in China is use a lot of people. They got a lot of people. We don't want to do that in, in the uh, USA. So it's nice if we can do it, you know, like that with a grayler. Uh, harvest timing is, is, is a logistical thing problem because of the and if this thing does work best when it's cold, uh, fish stay fresher, you know, and they're going to pile up as many fish as you're seeing there. That the, uh, the you know you don't want to be trying to deal with that. In, you know, a quarter million pounds of fish when it's really hot outside, and you're never going to have enough ice for them. Uh, so. um, we are making some technology improvements. This is some of uh, Josie's data here, Josie Ridgeway. Uh, and, and he's been looking at driving methods, and, the, uh, and this is a, right here, this is a, a combination acoustic and electric, uh, where he's using electric fishers and, uh, and the sound driving at the same time. And uh, you see that's a sub substantial bump in, in getting the fish to move. And at this, he's, at this point, he's driving these fish through a throat, which is something that Kevin does when he runs one of these things, but we don't uh, do. Uh, we just we want to leave a big open area. So but again, I think that's more like uh, you know different people are going to fish differently, and it's not it's not one, one way necessarily wrong. It's just different. Um, and we find that this you know regular uh, inexpensive size scan units work really good. Just to find out where the fish are. The Chinese don't have that. They're out there. They're trying to find out where the fish are by setting gill nets, which is a problem for them. And we don't we don't mess with that. Uh, commercial net pullers, and we're trying to trap designs. This is some, some uh, uh, these are size scan video, and this is when you get the fish really compacted, that's what you're looking at. It's basically just piles of fish down there, you can't see through it. Uh, this is the net right here, you can see the fish lined up on the, on the, on this side of the net, and then out over here, and that's what you end up uh, with. Again, you see that here, these, these balls of fish, when they get, Excited at the end when they know that hey I'm in a trap, you end up with these these balls of fish like this, and then there's a net right there, and you can see that there's almost nothing on the other side. Uh, and this is a picture of this is the change in, in depth. It's only about three feet really change in depth between here and here, and it's still about uh, ten foot deep right there in the, sh in the edge of that cliff. But those fish we couldn't drive them up that. So and it's something we learned about you know. We could not get those fish to move up over this little bit of a hump. And uh, we had to totally go back and rearrange our nets and try to drive them around. So they, we just could not move the fish over that hump. So that's some of the, one of the things we've learned. Slight, slight differences in morphology will make a big difference, especially when the fish get a little bit excited when they, when they think that something's up. Then there's regulatory things. You know, you guys that are managers know that we can't just let people do this, you know, randomly. We have to figure out how to, what works for you guys. Yeah. Um, the, and we had, uh, and, and when we did this as a part of the Missouri conservation thing, this is what's left after we, um, well, we hauled off a whole day's worth of fishing, and then and we had four dumpsters on top of that that we hauled off. And this is the, what's left after four dumpsters on the second day of fishing. And, they, and there's, there's a lot of fish piled up right there, and they had nothing to do with it. We couldn't get rid of them. And all these things were going to, uh, to the, to the uh, landfill. And the reason for that is 
Missouri's regulations didn't allow it to do anything else. But they're, they're trying to fix that, and so that's all, you know, that's not part of my job, but that's just something you guys have to be aware of. Um, so again, we have the most multi-user conflicts that, you know, that, uh, this, that, that one we did where we pulled it out 240,000 pounds, we still had a, a large number of fish trapped at the edge in, in our nets. We could have done another big pull and pulled a lot more fish out. Um, but we had to get out of there because we had an ice storm, the third ice storm in a, in a, in a row that, while we're doing this thing and I don't want my guys working on a boat during an ice storm and falling off the boat with everything gets slick so we just can't send everybody home for three days while the ice came. We came back and we had to pull the nets because we had some uh, a polar plunge going on in that area and they, they made us pull our nets and there was thousands of pounds of fish, I don't know how many, it's hard to tell, but there was a huge number of fish trapped in a really tight area and we had them sewed up. We had to just pull the stakes and let them out. So, the, uh, but I still think, despite that, that we we don't we have pretty big error bars on the percentage of fish we pulled, but the lower end of that error bar is about 50 percent. So we did we hit them pretty hard. We hurt them, even despite the fact having to run off in the middle of it. Public perception of these things again. Ron talked about this. I think that doing it right, you might see some. If you do it wrong, you're going to get some bad public perception. Do it right, and they see these pile of carp coming out. You are not going to have too much problem. Climbing. And so, again, this whole thing is one part of the answer. It is not the whole story. And I just okay, we got this out. This method, we're going to, you know, the problem's not a problem anymore. It's not a silver bullet, but it is a useful method. And to think about the way you're doing this thing it does require. So, you know, we're going to get better at this thing as, as over time. Hopefully I can finish up and we're going to talk more about the unified method. The screens might be, not be sized up correctly, but the unified method to me is a way that we put all the tools that we have available uh, in the water to, to maximize catch. The Chinese have been doing this for thousands of years, right? So when they go to a lake, they know how to put those gears out because they've already done it for hundreds of years and say, don't do that. We've been doing it maybe five years or, or three years. Um, so we're going to learn over the next you know, deployment that we should have done it this way, and just by experience. And Dwayne is doing a great job of collecting scientific data on how this all works together. So a great part of this was actually going to China and actually learning from the fishermen. So Dwayne and his wife Mary and Joanna, um, who was one of those few that spoke uh, English and Mandarin, was there. So we're going to almost an ancient civilization. They're doing, they're, they've been fishing these same lakes for a long time, and we're learning from, from the best, I would say. And this is their senior fisherman. He was out on the water. Notice, he doesn't have a big outboard. He does have a diesel-powered uh, outboard on the back, but they're going very quietly. This is tens of thousands of acres on this lake, and they, they're using uh, oars to move around, to move fish. They're going very quietly. Our fishermen do not have the patience to do this over months. So that's where the conflict arises. They want to catch them all now. The Chinese know, well, two months, we'll have. And, and like I said, there's plenty of help. But he, he actually gave us quite the uh, explanation on the water. These guys, that's all they do. They're fishermen full time. They live in their villages. That's their whole life is fishing these lakes. And they use a lot of net. You know, we used how many miles of net, Dwayne? We two and a half miles of net in total. Yeah, this one net's probably two and a half miles long. Right. And, they, you know, and they, they leave them in place. They don't have jet skis. They don't have water skiers. They don't have bass boats. These lakes are, are really floodplain lakes, as we visited, of the Yangtze River, a huge river in the world. Um, and they're shallow, flat. They don't have snags. They've really been fished just for this purpose. They do use electric fishing, though. And they were very excited. You have some fishing camps that say fit, uh, electric fishing is good, and other ones say, oh no, that's wrong, it hurts to fish. But culturally, they're divided, but very simple electric fishing, big, long electric seine that they use to pull. And they do it very quietly, They're just very um, uh, quietly going across the bay, and again, taking months. And probably the biggest thing is you have to go in with a plan. Whatever your lake looks like, you have to spend time, you have to map out your actions, you have to know where the deep cuts are, where the shallows, where the fish are going to get hung up. If you scare a fish, where are they going to go? They're going to run from the shallow out to the deep. Let's use that to our advantage. That's what the Chinese are using. That's, that's why this is a unified, using our minds and our gear. And the gear varies. 
Sometimes we're, we're successful. Uh, Dwayne and I had were hosted, and it was, they were very friendly. They allowed us to. This is another culture species that they use for food, but they do use multiple species in their selection. It's not just a cucumber. Side note. When a garden is, is pillaged in the fall of the year, the only thing left are the peppers. Ask yourself why. So we took a commercial fisherman over. He said, well, I'd like to try one of these peppers. Everything else, all the cabbages are gone. He took one of those peppers and it bawled like a baby for 10 minutes. So uh, wonder why they're all there. It doesn't take too many peppers to, to, to cook well. Just a note to sell. So one thing we're doing in Illinois, we're, we're using these methods and typical uh, commercial fishing methods to our advantage because we're trying to protect the Great Lakes. We're trying to reduce the population in the upper part of the Illinois River, the lower part where the fish are reproducing and, and the highest numbers are available to commercial fishermen. So I contract with fishermen. I actually pay their whole day. They don't make any money on the fish they catch. But we can script what they're doing and how they're doing it in places of the middle uh, of this session to remove 1.3 million pounds of fish annually. Uh, working with our biologists, and we're capturing the data so we can do it better. And at some point, we can then transfer the information so they can do it commercial. Uh, leading edge, we have electric barrier, as you may know. Um, when we don't find fish in Brian Road Pool, the Dresden Island Pool is that leading edge where we take maybe 800 or 1,000 fish out annually. The population there, since we've done the direct harvest, is down 96% based on our hydroacoustic assessments since 2012. So in seven years, that's our gauge. So I guess when you're harvesting, how are, how are you going to be successful? How are you gauging success? Think about that. Um, hydroacoustics is one way we can do it. We also look at fish health. Condition of the native fish, like shad and buffalo, um, helps us see, you know, is this all working? Are we just moving at 1.3 million pounds with another 2 million coming? Um, we deploy this, so just, just have a goal and, and how you're going to assess that. So this is what our unified method look, looks like on a 500 acre lake in the middle of that area that we're contract fishing. And in the first year we did this, we took two weeks in 2016 to go from the west uh, up to the east to this catch area and catch them in the same. You already saw that picture where we entrapped the fish and most of those fish came out of the same. And we had these compartments. You can see how they're bundled together. And our goal was to move the fish, drive the fish up through these funnels, and then close them off. Move them up through here, close them off. Using the Chinese wisdom, these first couple days, we didn't let the people bang on their boats, the fishermen. We said, we've got to go really slow. The fishermen said, just go, Chinese said, go very slow. And I had to order a psychiatrist to come in, because our fishermen did not get that. They were just, they didn't like it today. So once we started getting about day two, we said, okay, go ahead and start banging your boats. Uh, and they started making more noise. But it was very successful over those two weeks. We removed about 100,000 pounds of fish. Um, Dwayne was there. We, had to, we were doing a lot more science work than just the harvest would, would require. But we want to learn more about this. This is the, our trap nets we put in, because these lakes are connected to the main channel through tubes. We do block their. Uh, movement from getting out. We, either we catch them or, or we catch them in the same. It takes a lot of effort. We don't have the, the effort like the Chinese do, but, but these are trailers full of net that we put out there. Uh, some of those nets are 15 to 30 feet deep, um, you know, so you can't put these in, in lots of different places. The reason we have 30 foot deep nets is we actually have to go up in the canals of Chicago. 30 foot deep navigation channel. And if we have to deploy in those areas, we have to have the appropriate gear. The guys are really excited about moving around these heavy nets, too. And you kind of see what this looks like in the water instead of having those square cone like things because of the way this lake is set up, long and narrow, we use these funnels. So we leave it open, and then after the fish pass, we think they're clear, and then they close them off. Generally, generally for assessment too, we'll put a commercial fisherman back in here and run gill nets and, and to confirm what the hydroacoustics are telling us. So that's what the funnels look like when they're all deployed. Looks like a big trap net, just a bunch of them in, in a row. Then after we let them go, we use revving of the motors, pounding on the boats, 
plungers for some uh, of the boaters, electric fishing, we had sound boats that all was working together to move fish from one end of the lake to the other. Again, that's what it looks like. Lots of net, then all the action at the end. In 2016, we were very vigilant to do more of the pushing if we were able to get around them with, with our same. Since then, we have not. We've been just 17 and 18 <coughs> here in the spring, but we can't seem to get back around them with the same. Maybe it's that depth contour, there's a little berm there that the fish don't want to go over, but we catch them uh, about the same number of fish, but we have to pull them out of gill nets. Uh, this is pulling that stain at the end. We do have a puller for this group. Uh, it's an 800 yard stain, but at the end it just has to be pulled by hand. Some big fish, some little fish, but at the end we got them all boiled together. The first year we did not have that brailer, but our commercial fisherman says we're not doing that again, handling each one of those fish, and he brought the brailer the following year. So in 2018, uh, in all, uh, both our directed, unified efforts and going out there every other week with these fishermen, we took about 1.3 million pounds out. And that's what's leading to uh, our, what our observation is of fewer fish at the leading edge. So that's meeting our management goal of reducing the chance of them moving and then reducing the abundance where they exist. In those three pools, you can see uh, just by a heat map, we no longer catch all the fish up in here or just in here. We've moved down to Starved Rock, and actually the bulk of our fish are, are now in Starved Rock Pool. That was not the case when we hit the water in 2011. It was Mark Sales Pool that was 90%, 25 pound plus big head carp, and now it's 95% all silver carp, very small. So we see a demographic change as well. So two days since we started this, we've removed 7.7 .7 million pounds uh, from our contracted fishing. We're using all the, the, the gear in the playbook. We use gill nets and travel nets. There's a few weeks in the spring that we know hoop nets. The fish leave the backwaters and they're moving to the river like a pre-spawn activity. We can hit them really good with hoop nets. It was about three or four weeks in May we were out there. We're using these pound nets in places. I don't think we're using the pound nets the best we can. We, we can learn to use those better. We're using the same hauls, both the big mesh and small mesh. Uh, if we were concerned about small fish being up there, we uh, pull out a small mesh versus the same. Uh, we did that in 2015. Uh, we have very little impact to native fish, and that's important. There's no commercial fishing up here, and people do like to, to recreate. Very similar to where we are here. You have to demonstrate that. And then the bottom line, that leading edge hasn't moved uh, since we started working, but even going back into 1990, when the first fish was caught there. So, so our fishing has helped to keep, keep the situation in, in play. I mentioned you do have to evaluate uh, your, your processes. You can, throw, you can remove fish, but is it enough? Are we doing it in the right places? So we are using uh, telemeter fish, uh, a network of, of receivers in the water. We're using satellite tracking. Uh, we've got some in real time that'll ping your phone. Um, 24 hours a day, where they're at, when they're up near the surface. Um, those things are very helpful. They've identified areas where we can fish. Um, we use SIU and the Fish and Wildlife Service to use hydroacoustics, side looking to help find densities of fish. And communication is really important in our efforts when we're out of water. And uh, we've got a hydroacoustic crew out there and say, hey, underneath this bridge, the mouth of the Kanky Key, we see a ball of fish, we think they're carp. If we're underwater, we can respond nearly instantaneously. And that's, we've gotten fish out of uh, several different places where we probably wouldn't have been fishing there. In our evaluation of, a, of the whole removal project, not just the unified method, is we're looking at the plankton levels too. Um, we have seen a recovery of the large body plankton wow. in, in the water at the leading edge Brandon Road Pool. Uh, Gizzard shad condition is up, and we've seen the plankton community change. And it says there's less things foraging on it. So pre and post, so in the evaluation process we go and this is just based on hydroacoustics. Um, this is what we get. We go in before we do these efforts. We get a heat map so we know where uh, the fish abundances are highest. 
And then we go in afterwards, it's pretty clear, but the densities are much different. In the uh, 2016 efforts, we think it's about 82% effective. We took about 82% of the, the, so by Chinese standards we failed, but we thought we did pretty good, removing 100,000 pounds of fish. Um, and that holds through from uh, numerical or, or biomass. We've done this many times, and this is our uh, 2016 effort, but we've done it in 17 and 18 different locations, including that 15 mile long uh, navigation channel. Um, that we've gone from the top of the pool all the way to the bottom, that is significantly different from pre and post. It's just on, on the wrong scale. But we're making significant differences. And once we go into that one lake and do this, we don't have to go return to there. We can concentrate in other parts of the river and instead of going back to this lake every other week. So in all, it makes us more effective throughout the summer. And, and overall, then that annual assessment and at Dresden Island, pools at leading edge, we have seen a 96% decline. But even downstream, where the abundances are, are still relatively high, you can see pretty significant changes in the overall density of fish. So long-term strategy seems to be working. We're, and we definitely see it from, from relatively high abundances to fairly low as we go towards Lake Michigan. It's our biggest concern. And to build on our successes there uh, this next year, probably the next month or so, we're going to start working with commercial fishermen. So the lower Illinois River is open to commercial harvest. We're going to add another 10 cents a pound, very similar to what we're doing here in Kentucky, uh, as they will come to Peoria Lake. That for, for management needs, we need fish out of here, we believe, before down here. So if fishermen are willing to come fish there, and they can get their 10 or 15 or 20 cents a pound at the markets, they can get an additional 10 cents a pound through a program uh, with uh, Illinois DNR from uh, GLRI money through the Fish and Wildlife Service. This will be really important to evaluate. If it's successful, we may be able to argue that moving farther downstream, coming up with a basin-wide approach, we can work with Kentucky and figure out how do we build this beyond just the Illinois River. you got to have a place for the fish to go. Ron, Ron already mentioned it. I'm not going to talk about it much more, but Maine is in dire need of bait. Silver carp, I think, are, is a good bait. So we're jumping through some hurdles to make sure they're safe, VHS uh, free, disease free, uh, so these fish have a place to go and it helps meet our management needs. That is all I have, Greg. Can we get on your schedule? You're on schedule. We have time for questions. Yeah. It is. It, it, it's all through GLRI, and it's all for the management uh, of keeping the fish out of the Great Lakes. We, we have to be very careful we're not setting up economic incentive for business. That may happen, but ours is management driven. So, and we understand how but, um, confusing that can be. It's not a subsidy for the, the business. It's to meet our management goal, the fewer fish at the leading edge. That's why we need... When we talk about this, like talk about messaging, we need people in Congress to tell them if, fish, if they want Fish and Wildlife Service to build the businesses, they need to be very specific because otherwise they don't have the authority to do it. Right. It's really all how you control the It's very important. I want to talk to you later about how you control that message. Yeah, okay. I didn't hear that, Peter. Oh, I was wondering if you were concerned and thinking about possible improvement events that might complicate yeah. the process. It's really nice in the upper river. We do see spawning, <coughs> but because these fish are spawning in the current, all the eggs and larvae are going down to, to the lower river. That's where we see young fish. If that changes, we would expect to see our success rate change, yeah. right? Because uh, we could recruit, and now we got to fight annual recruitment. Right now, they have to swim back up into the area through locks and dams, or sometimes those things are open, open river. In 2015, we had a big recruitment event. We found six inch fish as evidence of recruitment in that lower Starved Rock pool. We have not seen that since. Um, I guess my worst nightmare is we get a 
population, the founding population, farther up, like in the Kankakee River, they start reproducing, and then they'll have all sizes. Right now, we are we generally have 16 inches larger fish in the upper river. That's, that leads to our success. Yeah. What are those abundance estimates based on? Is that high Tuesday or size? It, it is relative abundance density based on side scan and hydroacoustic surveys. Um, Southern Illinois University does these for us. They do them bi monthly throughout the summer, uh, but, but these numbers I showed you are either event specific or fall numbers, uh, trying to be consistent. But it, wouldn't, it doesn't surprise us. You know, we go out there and they seem to be fairly consistent over, over the summer. Any other questions? 